And now we'll go ahead and kick off our first session, uh, the birth of commercial space beyond Apollo to the shuttle era. It's going to be moderated by Dr. Scott Pace. Dr. Pace is the director of the Space Policy Institute and professor of the practice of international affairs at the George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. Dr. Pace rejoined the faculty of the Elliott School of International Affairs in 2021 after serving as deputy assistant to the president and executive secretary of the National Space Council from 2017 to 2020. He previously served as the associate administrator for program analysis and evaluation at NASA from 2005 to 2008 and Deputy Chief of Staff for the NASA Administrator from 2002 to 2003. Prior to NASA, Dr. Pace was the Assistant Director for Space and Aeronautics in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And now to turn it over to uh, Dr. Pace. Outstanding, thank you. Uh, so first of all, Brian, thank you uh, for organizing uh, this event. Uh, I think this is a, a terrific thing. And one of the, I think, special things that NASA does, it's not always recognizes the importance of the NASA History Office um, and the attention NASA pays to uh, issues beyond just those of the technology uh, itself. I, I think it, it what makes NASA, uh, again, a special place. Uh, our speakers this afternoon are going to be uh, covering the period, focusing on the 1980s and 1990s, uh, covering uh, what uh, Alex talked about in terms of different stories that we tell, both uh, internally and, and externally. Uh, about uh, different views of commercial space in NASA. Um, and so particularly it's gonna be about the, the, the shuttle era. But I'd like to start a little bit earlier than that uh, to set the scene, not so far back as the 1840s as Alex did, uh, but, uh, but to really talk about how uh, the aerospace industry looked at the end of Apollo. Uh, the aerospace was certainly a very uh, uh, prominent part of, the, uh, of Los Angeles where I grew up. And so I'm kind of another child of Apollo of the 1960s. Uh, I tell people that for Apollo 11, I was uh, literally in Disneyland where uh, large screens had been set up uh, for the park goers, uh, which is a, a nice mixture of images. Uh, in 1976, I had my first paying job as a technical aide at JPL uh, when Viking landed on Mars. So that was pretty cool. But Apollo had ended by this time and the Skylab and Apollo Soyuz missions uh, were absolutely terrific and of course followed them avidly. The question of course was what was next? Um, the shuttle had great promise, but it wasn't flying. And uh, those of us uh, who had been following the space program didn't quite realize uh, what uh, of course John Lawson uh, did later was the reason we had done Apollo was for political purposes, not because uh, we were interested in exploring space or had the same vision uh, that uh, the rest of the space enthusiasts did. Uh, now, as, a, uh, as an undergraduate, uh, I also met uh, Gerard O'Neill, um, maybe a few years before Jeff Bezos, uh, but at a physics talk, and I was struck uh, by the idea of alternatives to the government, uh, to doing everything. Now, how about earning our own way, uh, going outward? And so I'm sure some people here have heard of the L5 Society, or maybe not. Um, but this was the first real alternative to the classic von Braun paradigm, which still holds a powerful hold on our imaginations, uh, the idea of, of living and working in large numbers of people settling in space, whether it takes the current Bezos version or Musk version. Now, in 1979, uh, with all due apologies to, to Neil Rosenbaum, who's a great general counsel for NASA, uh, I learned that there is a threat to the O'Neill paradigm uh, in the form of a proposed UN treaty known as the Moon Agreement. Uh, Article 11 in particular, uh, for those of you who are aficionados, uh, was pretty shocking in the rather socialist approach it took to what I and others thought was a new domain of opportunity. And uh, one could argue today about how the legal issues might be fixed. Uh, it was clearer than ever that commerce was crucial uh, to space development, and it could be a third way, an alternative way to the government approaches of military and civil programs. There could be room for individuals and corporations, not just governments. Um, and so early leaders of the L5 Society, like Keith and Carolyn Henson, and others, I think, deserve credit for taking the O'Neill vision and in translating it into what it might mean into policy. And what that meant was not relying solely on governments or centralized bureaucracies. Now, as the shuttle began flying in 1981, it became clear there was a lot to learn in low Earth orbit. 
but the cost and difficulty and time involved in using the shuttle meant it was not going to be the vehicle for routine space commerce. Uh, space industrialization uh, was certainly possible, uh, but the tools really weren't ready. Uh, I was working for the Shuttle Orbiter Division at Rockwell at the time, and I could see a lot of opportunities in satellite servicing, human-tended platforms, demands of commercial customers to better, frankly, better service and better turnaround and more business-friendly. Uh, but unfortunately, at this point, the shuttle had become a competitor, unintentionally, but a competitor to private enterprise. Uh, the subsidized prices NASA charged to attract payloads and keep a strong flight rate also discouraged private launch providers from being able to enter the markets. For several years, there was a lot of policy want conflicts uh, that I engaged in, uh, along with others, on shuttle pricing policy, the impact on Air Force missions, foreign competition in the form of the new European launcher Ariane. The Challenger tragedy ended that debate uh, with the movement of payloads that could use rockets uh, being moved off the shuttle manifest. In the late 80s, 1980s, we saw not only traditional aerospace firms uh, entering the launch market with Delta and Atlas vehicles, but also startups like American Rocket Company. Um, my friend Jim Bennett, who a, had a strong role in setting up the Commercial Space Launch Act. Orbital Sciences Corporation, whose founders uh, actually met in grad school about the same time I, I met John Logson. Uh, and the point of all this sort of personal history, though, is that the commercial energy we're seeing uh, in space today is merely the latest of uh, several waves that have occurred uh, in the post-Apollo era. Uh, each of these waves has been getting stronger, better technology, better plans, uh, better capitalization. And so while the risks remain high, we've in fact just now starting to enter, I think, the commercial era that we had first hoped for um, at the end of Apollo. We pause there and uh, take a moment to introduce uh, who are going to be our four speakers. Um, our first speaker is going to be uh, John Logson, uh, my uh, predecessor and emeritus and still very heavily active, for which I am grateful, uh, the Space Policy Institute. Uh, he's going to be talking about space commercialization during the uh, Reagan administration. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, John really is the founder of Modern Space Policy, uh, written a number of seminal works and uh, really helped to simply create this field. Uh, his research interests have been focused on historical aspects of U.S. and international uh, space activities from Kennedy and Nixon and, of course, now Reagan. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Jonathan Coopersmith of Texas A&M University. Uh, the wonderful title, what, are, what Were We Thinking? Space Commercialization, 1981 to uh, 2002. Uh, he's a professor at uh, Texas A&M University where he teaches history of technology. Um, in uh, 19, uh, 20, in, excuse me, 19, in 2016, uh, his book, Facts, The Rise and Fall of the Facts Machine, was a co-recipient of the Business History Conference uh, Hagley Prize for the best book on business history. And his current research includes failures in technology, the importance of frothy and fraudulent firms and emerging technologies, and ensuring the preservation of space-related archives, uh, which I have to plug is, I think, is a terrific idea uh, there is absolutely a need for archives beyond those of traditional uh, national archives for the space community. Um, we'll have a look at my basement and I can make some contributions. Uh, our third speaker, uh, lit, longtime uh, space person in the community, uh, Linda Billings, uh, now at the National Institute of Aerospace, uh, talking about commercial space in the 1980s, a former journalist view. Uh, Linda is currently a consultant to NASA's astrobiology and planetary defense programs, and she's worked in the aerospace community since the early 1980s. She, she's seen everything. Uh, and then finally, uh, Brian Adjuro, uh from Georgia Institute of Technology, uh, talking about the politics of commercialization and the near collapse of American remote sensing 1978 to 1998. Uh, he's an instructor of history at uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, teaches history of spaceflight, certified archivist and historian, um, and received his PhD in history of science and technology from Georgia Tech. Uh, taught at the University of South Carolina and has held aerospace fellowships at the National Aerospace, uh, Air and Space Museum and NASA. Uh, in particular, I uh, note that uh, his, his work is uh, in uh, Seeds of Discovery and chapters in economic history of innovation within NASA. And he's also published in Quest, the history of uh, spaceflight quarterly. Um, I think there, I think it might be true that there have been more PhDs in space history and policy published around the perils of the Landsat program probably than any other single program 
I think in our uh, in our in our space history.